Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar in the CERDEP and ESCCP webinar series. My name is Rula Deep. I'm a principal at Geosyntac Consultants in Oakland, California, and the coordinator of the webinar series on behalf of CERDEP and ESCCP. I will be facilitating today's call. The webinar will consist of a brief overview of CERDEP and ESCCP by Dr. Andrea Leeson, followed by a listing of the upcoming webinars in CERDEP and ESTCP's webinar series. Following Andrea's opening remarks, we will transition to the technical portion of the webinar. Today's event will feature two speakers who will discuss characterization and remediation in fractured rock environments. First, Dr. Charles Schaefer will talk about designing, assessing, and demonstrating sustainable bioaugmentation for the treatment of Dean Apple sources in fractured bedrock. His presentation will be followed by a brief Q&A session. Second, Dr. Lee Slater will discuss the use of a geophysical toolbox for characterizing and monitoring amendment delivery in fractured rock aquifers. And his presentation will also be followed by a brief, brief Q&A session. We will conclude the webinar with an interactive Q&A session, including both of our speakers. Today's broadcast will be listen only you may submit questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of your screen. You do not need to wait until the Q&A period to submit your questions. In fact, we do encourage you to submit questions in advance of the Q&A sessions. With over 430 people on today's call, it is logistically challenging to open all the lines for oral questions. Therefore, the phone lines will remain listen only throughout this presentation. Here we have provided a few suggestions in the event that you experience difficulties with the, with the broadcast audio. Typically, any delay will be fixed if you refresh your screen or call into the conference line. However, if you continue to have technical issues, please submit a comment using that chat box in the lower left corner of your screen. With that, I would like to introduce Dr. Andrea Leeson. Andrea is the Deputy Director of CERDEP and ESTCP, as well as the Program Manager for Environmental Restoration. Andrea has been with CERDEP and ESTCP since 2001, and before that, she was a research scientist at Battelle Memorial Institute, where she conducted research on in-situ bioremediation. Andrea, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Rula, and welcome everyone to CERDEP and ESTCP's webinar today. CERDEP is the Strategic Environmental Research and Development Program and was established in 1991 by Congress as a partnership between the DOD, the Department of Energy, and the EPA. CERDEP's mission is to identify and address high-priority environmental science and technology opportunities that focus on DOD requirements. We fund both fundamental research as well as advanced technology development that ultimately impacts real-world environmental management. ESTCP is the Environmental Security Technology Certification Program in which we demonstrate innovative environmental and energy technologies. These investments typically capitalize on past investments under CERTIP or other research programs and are designed to transition technologies out of the lab and into the field. Especially important in all ESTCP demonstrations is the ultimate transition to implementation and regulatory acceptance. CERDIP and ESTCP are complementary programs with much of CERDIP research occurring at the lab and pilot scale with occasional field efforts, while ESTCP demonstrations are primarily at the pilot and field scale, although occasionally supporting lab efforts are conducted. There are four program areas in CERDIP, five in ESTCP. The energy and water program area is only in ESTCP, while the other four, environmental restoration, munitions response, resource conservation and climate change, and weapons system and platforms are sort of and ESTC pro ESTCP programs that are managed jointly by a designated program manager. Our webinar today is focused on research and demonstrations that were conducted under the environmental restoration program area. Environmental restoration has essentially five main areas of research, contaminated groundwater, contaminants on DOD testing and training ranges, contaminated sediments, wastewater treatment, as well as risk assessment. Our webinar series will be highlighting research and demonstration efforts from each of the five program areas, 
and shown here is a list of some upcoming webinars. As you can see, our webinars will cover a broad range of topics with upcoming topics covering munitions response to hexavalent chrome elimination to emerging contaminants. The next webinar based on research and demonstrations under environmental restoration will be on October 29th and will focus on assessment and treatment of contaminated sediments. You can find more information about upcoming webinars on the CERTIP and ESCCP website. Registration is now live for the next webinar on underwater geophys geophysical sensors on September 17th. I hope you enjoy the webinar today. Rula? Thank you, Andrea. And it is now my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Charles Schaefer. Um, Charles is a um, senior engineer with CDM Smith in Edison, New Jersey. His areas of research include pore scale diffusion and mass transfer processes, in situ bioremediation, treatment of emerging contaminants, and electrochemical treatment of drinking water. Charles has served as a principal investigator on several CERTIP and ESCCP uh, projects, many of which have focused on chlorinated solvents in bedrock systems. He has bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in chemical and biochemical engineering from Rutgers in New Jersey, and nearly 15 years of consulting experience. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Charles. Thank you very much, uh, Rula. And I guess I'd like to start uh, today's talk by just acknowledging um, the uh, project team, uh, Greg Lavornia and Tim Alt at CBNI, uh, Mike Annable and Erin White at University of Florida, and they really took the lead in some of the uh, some of the modeling efforts that uh, I'll be talking about today. And also, I want to acknowledge AECOM, who has provided uh, some uh, very much needed field field support. So just in terms of agenda, what I would like to discuss today, I'm briefly going to give uh, just a little bit of background information related to uh, Dean Apple and also fractured bedrock. Then I really want to probably spend a good chunk of time just looking and, and discussing our results with respect to Dean Apple architecture and fractured bedrock. And then uh, wrapping up with looking at uh, our bio augmentation for removal of our Dean Apple sources. <clears throat> So in terms of, of the motivation for this research, I'm sure many, uh, many of the folks listening to this talk today you know, certainly realize that chlorinated solvents and, and fractured bedrock is really one of the biggest environmental challenges facing the Department of Defense and, and, also, and also many, uh, many industrial uh, clients as, as well. <clears throat> and, uh, and Dean Apple alone is, is also a, a large problem, but when you have Dean Apple sources and, and fractured bedrock, uh, then, then you have a pretty, a pretty challenging problem in, in front of you. Um, <clears throat> I guess the other issue related to this is you know, I think over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been many, <clears throat> many tools developed for, for assessing Dean Apple distribution in, in unconsolidated materials. But when you think about Dean Apple and fractured bedrock, you know, many of these tools either aren't appropriate or in many cases really haven't been fully uh, demonstrated in terms of their ability to help uh, I identify quantif and quantify Dean Apple sources. And then, you know, then finally, again, looking at, at Dean Apple and fractured bedrock, you know, how, how can in situ treatments be uh, cost effectively applied to, to treat and, and remove this, this Dean Apple? So uh, for that reason, we're, we were taking a, a very close look, uh, look at this issue within this, this ESTCP project. So just, just briefly, um, a little bit of background here. Uh, there's been really several published studies looking at uh, applying bioaugmentation bio to treat Dean Apple sources in, in unconsolidated media, and these, you know, uh, these studies have shown that, that bioaugmentation, in fact, can be effective for these Dean Apple sources. You know, uh, I guess uh, similarly, uh, there's been uh, at least a, a good handful of, of published studies looking at uh, applying bioaugmentation <clears throat> to treat chlorinated solvents. In, in fractured bedrock, but not necessarily looking at treating Dean Apple source areas, or, or at the very least, closely evaluating uh, <clears throat> the, the Dean Apple sources and, and how how they were removed. <clears throat> so really, really, what's what hasn't uh, been been shown or demonstrated is really looking at bio augmentation for for treating Dean Apple uh, in fractured bench bedrock. Uh, we did recently uh, in a in a uh, 
previous CERTA project look at bio-augmentation, bio-augmentation for, for uh, removing Dean Apple sources and fractured rock. But this was, uh, this was just, a, uh, just at, at the bench scale. And the next slide I'm going to show here is just kind of uh, shows what that study entailed. We had little uh, blocks of rock, about 30 centers. 30 centimeters by 30 centimeters and a few centimeters uh, thick. We kind of split the rock and created a, a single fracture plane there. Uh, we then kind of sealed the edges and kind of made an, an influent and effluent side and, and were able to, to flood that fracture plane with water, then PCE, then, then get residual PCE in there, and we, and we applied uh, bio-augmentation. And, and basically, when all was said and done here, I guess you know, the bottom line is that we were able to show in this very simple the bench scale experiment that, in fact, a uh, bio augmentation was effective for enhancing Dean Apple uh, dissolution, and the, and the extent of uh, an enhancement or treatment that we got was actually very similar to what uh, other studies had shown in, in unconsolidated media. So this was short, uh, certainly some some inter interesting work, at least at least from my perspective, and, and certainly. Uh, certainly showed some promise that bioaugmentation might be appropriate for treating Dean Apple sources in, in, in fractured bedrock. But certainly when you go from the uh, simple bench scale system uh, to, to the field scale, there, there are some really important application and scale up issues that need to be considered. And you know, the first thing uh, when considering potential field application of this is you know, can you even uh, identify and locate your Dean Apple sources in fractured and fractured bedrock. Certainly, that's been sh shown to be a very important thing to know in, in unconsolidated materials. But, but can we really do this in fractured bedrock? And you know, second uh, point there is, you know, what is the actual Dean Apple architecture within within the fracture network? And again, understanding your your Dean Apple architecture and where and where your Dean Apple is relative to your flow field has been shown to be very important in unconsolidated uh, materials and really important for for building and understanding your conceptual site model. And you know, and can we do this at in, within fractured bedrock? And this is so important when you know in those in those early stages for technology selection and then eventually uh, performance monitoring of, of really whatever technology you might uh, uh, select. Uh, how do Dean Apple sources impact the, the dissolved plume? And, and, and perhaps one of the biggest questions is, you know, can something like bio-augmentation be effectively applied to treat Dean Apple sources? You know, what kind of Dean Apple mass removal can you get? And, and maybe more importantly, what kind of impact on groundwater quality and mass discharge from, from the source area can you, can you get with that, with that technology? So to try to address or answer at least some of these questions, uh, we, we, uh, we've been working on an ongoing uh, and nearly completed uh, ESTCP project uh, at, at Edwards Air Force Base. And what you can see in the, uh, in the map here is the, is the, uh, is the dissolved phase bedrock uh, plume, which is kind of that, that light green outline that you see. It's, it's actually a very large plume, which, which uh, a PCE plume, which encompasses about 390 acres. The, the source area for the plume is, you can barely see it in the map here, but it's that building 8595 uh, uh, area where a uh, reportedly large release of uh, PCE at the, at the surface accord, occurred. Um, the, the bedrock here is a, is a fractured granite, and the uh, PCE impacts go very deep, at least uh, 200 feet below ground surface into the, into the bedrock. It's a very low transmissivity aquifer. Uh, some of the wells we put in were, were usually very happy if we could get even 100 mils per minute uh, total flow out of, out of those wells. Uh, very uh, high PCE concentrations at many locations, greater than 10% of the solubility, and that's certainly a, a red flag that, that certainly suggests the potential presence of, of Dean Apple. But uh, you know, prior to, to our kind of work in, in uh, testing there, there really hadn't been any direct evidence of, of, of Dean Apple at, at this site. So this next uh, figure here is just a kind of a close-up view of that building 8595 uh, area, which is kind of the head of this, of this uh, bedrock PCE plume. Um, and uh, what I have shown here is a, is a well layout where we, we had some injection, extraction, and monitoring wells we, we were going to use for a groundwater recirculation system to, to uh, facilitate uh, our uh, tracer testing and then ultimately our, 
our bioremediation. So you can see kind of at the head of that red shaded area, uh, we, I have a, a well, uh, B06, that was used as the, as the injection well, and that's a bedrock uh, injection well. And then kind of towards the bottom of that red shaded area, kind of at the ends of, of, the, of the T there, are two wells we use as uh, extraction wells, B12 and, and, and B13. And that's where we kind of recirculated uh, groundwater within that zone. Now, I should point out here that there is very little, uh, in fact, really, really none hydraulic influence uh, when we pumped at B12 and B13 on the source area, on the source area wells. Um, and then the, the uh, just going about 14, then about 30 feet south of that injection well, B06, we have B wells B11 and B07, and they were also bedrock monitoring wells that we use for this for this demonstration. And as I'll show on the next slide, we, we put packers in these wells and kind of made them multi-level um, uh, sampling wells. And I guess the last thing I'll, I'll point out here is that most of our tracer and amendment response was really at that closest well, that B11 well, about 14 feet to the south of, of our injection well. So that's really what we'll focus on uh, try, uh, uh, discussing and evaluating the results of, of, of this study. So this next figure here is kind of a, just a, a kind of a cartoon cross section looking at those uh, uh, at those bedrock monitoring wells. On the left, you have the, the injection well, B06, and then, then B11 and B07 as your, as, your, um, as your monitoring wells. And what I have shown there in, in those little red uh, boxes are the, are the locations of the packers and also the, the sampling pumps and the yellow boxes. So basically, in our injection well, B06, uh, through uh, a lot of the extensive borehole geophysical testing that we, that we did up front, as well as some discrete interval uh, packer testing and pump testing, uh, we, we found two hydraulically conductive zones in our, in our packer interval between about 60 feet and 85 feet below ground surface. And you can kind of see them on that figure there. Those dashed lines are attached to them, one at about 79 feet below ground surface and another at about 83 feet. And basically, basically what we found is we kind of found one hydraulic, uh, hydraulically connected zone via our pump testing, kind of running from B06 to the shallow zone in B11 and also to that middle interval in B07, and then a very hydraulically con uh, conductive zone, again, based on some discrete interval pump testing uh, going uh, from B06 to the deep zone in B11 to the, to the deep zone in, in B07. And it was comforting to know that the, the borehole geophysical logs, you know, did show uh, some fracture zones in those locations to confirm that, but um, uh, that that's kind of how we conceptualize our, our flow patterns, at least in the in the vicinity of our uh, of our injection well. So after this uh, kind of initial uh, testing, the first thing we wanted to do was to perform a uh, partitioning tracer test, and we uh, performed this test while we were recirculating uh, groundwater in that uh, in that test cell that I showed you a couple a couple slides. Uh, previously. So for, for uh, partitioning tracer tests, you know, what you, what's typically done is you'll use a conservative tracer. In our case, we use bromide. And you'll also use a, a hydrophobic tracer. In this case, we use a long chain alcohol. And what you can do as you evaluate the, the, the elution of these tracer, tracers, you look at how, how the alcohol tracer is retarded compared to the uh, to the conservative tracer, and, and by looking at that, you can A, uh, uh, determine if you have DNAPL present in a certain location, and by applying the method of moments analysis, uh, you can actually uh, quantify the amount of, of DNAPL there. So that, so that was the, the main goal of this partitioning tracer test. Um, the other information we got from the tracer test is you, you, can, uh, you can you get an estimate of your fracture porosity, which is, which is very, uh, very important to know and, and understanding your, your overall system. And the other, the other information we can get is, is by looking at how the, 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 the relative mass of tracer that uh, loops through each zone, say, for example, in the shallow zone of, of B11 versus that, that deep zone, uh, that, that is uh, approximately proportional to the transmissivity of that zone. So you actually get some indication of, of, your, of your flow field or your, or your permeability field from, from the tracer information. So what I want to jump into right now is, is looking at the, at the tracer results. And again, where we're looking at 
is, is at B11, that first well down gradient, about 14 feet from the injection well. And I want to look at the shallow zone first. So what we have plotted here are the, are the concentrations and the concentrations for both the bromide and the, uh, and the, uh, the dimethylpropanol uh, alcohol are both normalized to the injection concentration. And what you can see is, 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 is near the end of this, of this pulse, you see a little bit more tailing of your alcohol tracer, and that's, that's a good indication that you're seeing some, uh, some low-level retardation of that tracer and a good indication that there's DNAPL there. And in fact, when we applied uh, the method of moment analysis, we found that the, that the uh, fracture saturation or the relative saturation of DNAPL and the fracture, which is your DNAPL volume divided by your fracture volume, was really low, about 0.2%. We also found that about 50% of the flow went into, this, well, went into this, this shallow zone. So by doing this test, we confirmed that there was some DNAPL there, very low levels of DNAPL, but still uh, certainly enough to impact groundwater. And we also had some indication of, uh, of the flow field there. So this next graph is just this, the same results, but now we're in that deep interval of, of, B, of B11, and we uh, have the same type of tracer pulse that, that went in there. But however, the results here were a little different. Instead of seeing uh, more or less one distinct tracer pulse, we actually saw three pulses or at least three uh, three zones of tracer movement. And, and what I mean by that is we had a, an initial pulse uh, of, tr of tracer uh, come out at about one to one, one and a half days, and that's kind of what's blown up in that inset figure there. And certainly you see a lot of, of retardation of the, of the uh, alcohol tracer there relative to the, to the bromide. Then you kind of see that, that main peak that comes out at about two, two and a half days, and, and really we didn't see any uh, uh, retardation there. And then, and then we see from about uh, three or four days out to about 25 to 30 days, we see this, this, very, this very long tailing type, uh, type peak. So uh, our interpretation of this was that we have three different uh, fracture zones or, or fractures here, each kind of showing its own little tracer response, even within this, this deep interval of this, of this monitoring well. And when, you, when we apply the method of moments to each of these zones, we see that that initial peak uh, was a, uh, only had a very, very small amount of, of, of mass of the, of, of the tracer pulse. And this means that this zone was a very low transmissivity zone. But even though it's very low transmissivity, we actually had a high DNAPL saturation within the fractures, at least high compared to the other zones at 0.7%. Uh, the middle peak was still relatively low transmissivity, but uh, we didn't find any, any indications of DNAPL here. And then you had that late peak or that tailing peak, which was a, a much more transmissive fracture zone, but it also had a relatively low, about 0.04% uh, DNAPL saturation uh, uh, in the in the in the fracture zone. So again, this, using this tool was very insightful for understanding the flow field and also the also the DNAPL dis distribution. So, what what really are the results of this of this tracer test telling us? What's really important here? Well, the first thing is we we, we do get insight into the DNAPL distribution in this fracture zone and the DNAPL distribution relative to to the to the flow field. And what we find is that DNAPL is present not only in our high transmission transmissivity fractures, which, which we might ex expect, but we also see DNAPL in those low transmissivity zones, and actually we see, at least on a, on a relative fracture volume basis, we actually see the most DNAPL there. Uh, we were able to, to uh, determine or calculate an, uh, an average fracture porosity uh, of about 0.005, and again, this is an important parameter in, in trying to uh, assess and understand your system and, and linear flow velocities and things like that. Uh, we were also able to, to get an estimate of our DNAPL mass. Now, we had to make some simplifying assumptions here of, of you know, radial flow outwards from our injection well to that first monitored well. But we get a mass of about 1.5 kilograms. And, and understanding how much DNAPL mass you actually have present is, is really important because depending on how much is there, it might steer you to one type of technology versus another type. And uh, it's also important to know as you try to evaluate remedial progress. I mean, you, you can not determine how much DNAPL is present in your system just by looking at groundwater concentrations. So we feel this was a very useful tool for that.
Uh, perhaps what I found the most interesting is, you know, given the information that we have, and so we we know we know the the we have an estimate of the of the transmissivity field, so to speak. We know how much Dean apples in each of these zones. We get some some baseline uh, groundwater sampling, so we know what the ambient dissolved groundwater concentrations are. So we can just use a uh, perform a simple back of the envelope type of dissolution model under an, ambient conditions to ask, well, how long if we do nothing will this Dean apple persist? And if you look at, at, at your more uh, transmissive zones at B11S and that tail zone of B11D, you get time frames of about 13 to 44 years, even for those low levels of, of Dean Apple to, to go away. But if you look at your low transmissivity, transmissivity zone, uh, that kind of initial peak where we, where we saw uh, response, we're looking at a time frame of, of 200 years. And this, this is really interesting, but this tells us that it could be that the uh, Dean apple that's present in very low transmissivity fractures is what is, it could be what is sustaining a lot of these uh, plumes and fractured bedrock. I know there's been a lot of attention, and rightfully so, on, 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 on matrix back diffusion as a mechanism for sustaining these plumes, but it could be that uh, in many cases the culprit uh, might be Dean apple in some of these low, low transmissivity fractures. Just, uh, again, running with some of this information a little bit more, we can look at our PCE mass distribution and also, and also fluxes within, uh, within the source area. So kind of on the, on the right-hand side, side here, uh, we have our uh, 1,500 grams of PCE as our, as our Dean Apple mass estimate from the, from the tracer testing and method of moment analysis that I just went through. But how does that compare to what might be in, in the rock matrix? Well, we had uh, collected some... Uh, some, some rock core samples, kind of taking some slices of, of, of rock going inwards from, the, from a hydraulically conductive fracture and extracting a methanol and determining how much PCE is there. And if we, if we uh, you know, look at those numbers and make some conservative assumptions that, that essentially all the, the rock matrix has, has this level of PCE in there, we still find that there's about 10 times more PCE mass in those, in those fracture zones than what is in the rock matrix. So again, I think that points to the, the importance of, of understanding uh, your Dean Apple sources within, within a, a fractured bedrock source area. The other thing that, uh, is, is, that is interesting here is, is that the PCE concentrations going into the fractured bedrock are, are fairly uniform going in. Now, you see that graph. I mean, there's certainly your, your range of, of, of experimental sc uh, scatter there. But if, if matrix back diffusion would be, was the mechanism that, that was sustaining these, high, these relatively high PCE concentrations in these fractures, uh, then what you would expect is to see very low PCE concentrations essentially at the rock matrix, uh, at the fracture matrix interface, and then concentrations getting much higher as you, as you go in. You don't see that in, the, in, these, in these concentration profiles, and that might be a line of evidence to suggest that it is not matrix back diffusion sustaining the high concentrations here, but it's these, it's these uh, residual uh, Dean Apple sources. So after doing this characterization work, we initiated our bio augmentation just, just about a year, a year ago out at uh, Edwards Air Force Base. So we did this uh, you know, during recirculation. We first put in our, um, a lot of our remedial amendments, our, our lactate, diammonium phosphate, and, and yeast extract as, 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 as nutrients. Uh, we bio augmented using uh, CB&I's SDC9 culture, added about um, uh, five times times ten to the twelve cells per liter there, and then just then continued uh, with, uh, pulsing in our lactate and, and, nut and nutrients during this um, uh, during uh, uh, several months of of active remediation. And I guess what I want to do is is just. Uh, show a few figures to summarize the, re the results of, uh, of, that, of that testing. What I have here are results uh, at B11S, so that's a that shallow zone. I have two figures, one showing uh, the chlorinated VOCs, uh, the chlorinated ethenes, and also ethene, and then the, in the lower portion I have the chloride results. The, uh, the vertical dashed line that you see there is when we, when we initiated 
uh, our our bio uh, bio augmentation. So what you can see is, you know, basically uh, shortly after we we added our our bio amendments, we see the PCE concentrations uh, decreasing substantially. We also see DCE as our uh, as our primary daughter product. We really didn't see very much, maybe just some very trace levels of vinyl chloride and, and ethene. And that's really consistent with, with a lot of other studies that have looked at treating bean apple source areas. You don't get uh, that full dechlorination until, you, until some of those concentrations start to decrease and you move further down gradient of your, of your bean apple source area. Uh, we also, you know, also the, the increases in chloride concentration were another good, uh, good indicator that we were getting, um, uh, getting a lot of uh, reductive dechlorination going on. Just one last thing to point out here, you'll notice in that figure in the upper left-hand corner that you see that the PCE concentrations uh, increasing prior to our bio-augmentation, and, and that's because uh, our extraction wells, which were intended to be somewhat downgrading of the source area, and, and based on some, some data that we had previously, we expected to see much lower PCE concentrations in our extraction wells. However, the, uh, the PCE concentrations in our extraction wells uh, were about 80 milligrams per liter, so we were, we were constantly introducing very high concentrations of PCE into, uh, into our source area. So this next figure is, is essentially a, uh, tells a very similar story. This is just, just the deep zone at, B, at B11D, the, the top two figures, again, showing that we're getting, some, uh, getting a lot of dechlorination, a lot of chloride, a lot of chloride generation. Uh, and the bottom two figures, again, uh, on the, in the bottom left there, uh, just kind of showing that we were getting good nitrate and also, and also sulfate uh, reduction. And I guess this is, this is uh, of note because we did have some pretty high uh, sulfate uh, levels at the site between about 3 and 400 milligrams per liter. Uh, per liter. And uh, we were able to get good reduction over sulfate. And also in the lower right-hand corner, we have our dehalococoides uh, concentrations. You know, prior to bio-augmenting, we really didn't see anything, anything measurable uh, in, in the fractured bedrock, and then we saw the concentrations uh, increase several orders of magnitude uh, over time, uh, suggesting that we're getting growth of the bacteria and also, uh, also migration of the, of the bacteria. We also showed, saw some dehalococulti show up at the, at the next furthest monitoring well, uh, which, which, which was about 30 feet away. So those types of graphs are always interesting to show and, and demonstrate that we're getting some sort of reductive dechlorination. But you know, how is this? You know, how is this biological activity? Is it, is it really helping to uh, enhance the removal of that PCE bean apple? What we what we can do is uh, again uh, crunch some numbers there and look at look at our, our moles of uh, of chloride being generated and, and and DCE and all that and come up with a dissolution enhancement factor, which basically tells us how much more rapidly is the is that PCE dean apple dissolving during recirculation uh, compared to the, uh, to the case where, where we didn't bioaugment. And that enhancement factor we come up with is, is about a factor of five. And again, that's, that number is, is, is pretty consistent with, what, with the numbers we saw in our bench scale studies and also, uh, also very similar to, to values that other people have seen in, in unconsolidated uh, material. So you certainly get a, uh, a pretty significant enhancement of that, of that dean apple removal when you, uh, when you use uh, uh, bio-augmentation. At least that's what we observed in, in our study. The other thing is you know, when, when we crunched the numbers and uh, you know, did our mass balance, we, it kind of told us that after about six to eight months of treatment, we essentially were able to, to remove the dean apple sources that were, that were present in that, sor in that source area, at least in the, in the vicinity of the injection well and that, and that, and that B11 uh, monitoring well. So, well, that, that's great. You know, maybe, maybe we remove, maybe you believe we removed the, the Dean Apple sources, but how, how's that really going to help uh, site conditions? So, so what we did is, uh, what I did is a very simple screening level type model where we, we assumed, uh, if you look at the, at the figure in the upper left hand corner there, at time zero, we, we, we take out the Dean Apple sources and then, uh, and then we see the results, and then we have back diffusion of PCE coming from the rock matrix and how that's going to impact our, our groundwater concentrations. And what you see is, especially for the first year or two, that uh, you, know, you still have pretty high groundwater concentrations.
concentrations as, as, as your PC back fuses, back diffuses from the rock matrix. But over time, that, that, that the flux from the rock matrix greatly diminishes, and after, after a few years, you've, you've reduced source area concentrations by, by, by over, over an order, order of magnitude. And I guess this is, this is a pretty good indication that, that at least in, in, in this case, removing those DNAPL sources, if, if you're able to do that, you can really reduce your, your, your mass discharge coming, uh, coming off your source area, and that might, that might have very good benefits on your, on your down gradient uh, plume. I should also point out that we, uh, we, I assume for this simulation that there was no effective treatment or removal of PCE at all in, in the rock matrix. I think, I think in reality, uh, you are going to have some treatment at least very close to the, to the fracture interface, and that would, uh, and that would uh, reduce the, the adverse impacts of, of matrix back diffusion. So just to wrap up, in terms of some of the next steps we're actually uh, either in the process of doing or plan to do, we're, uh, right now we're uh, performing some rebound monitoring. Uh, we're about uh, three months. We, we shut the system down essentially in May, so we're, we're about three months in now and actually have just gone out and done our first round of rebound monitoring and have another round or two planned. Uh, we want to do a, a final partitioning tracer test, so basically run that tracer test again to see, uh, see what kind of differences we see in tracer response, uh, not only in, in removal of Dean Apple, but what may have also changed in the flow field. And one other thing that we'd like to do is, is to go back out and collect another rock core just to see what type of impact we might have on uh, PCE concentrations, especially close to that, to that fracture interface. So just concluding, uh, you know, hopefully I've made an argument that DNAPL mass and architecture can be determined or at least estimated in fractured bedrock, and we can really, I think, learn a lot about the conceptual site model if, if, we, if we take a look at this, and I think this might be useful for, for really understanding the site and also for, for site management. Uh, DNAPL may account for the majority of contaminated mass and also discharge from the source area. And I think this is particularly true if you have a, have a, a rock matrix that has a relatively low matrix, matrix porosity. Uh, DNAPL may reside in low transmissivity fractures, and it could be that, that it is this DNAPL in low transmissivity fractures that, that is uh, sustaining, or at least potentially sustaining, some of these plumes. And, and finally, bio-augmentation bio may, for many sites, be a viable solution for treating uh, DNAPL sources in fractured bedrock. And here's my contact information, and uh, thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Charles, for a very informative presentation. Uh, this slide uh, gives you a link to where uh, the detailed information for the ESSP project that Charles discussed, where you can find the, the reports. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start uh, responding to the questions received, but I'd like to remind you all to please submit additional questions by using the chat box on the left-hand portion of the screen. Uh, so with that, Charles, the first question is, were you able to deliver remedial amendments into the low transmissivity fracture zone? Now that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, so. Uh, we, we certainly were able to uh, deliver our tracers, or you know, both our bromide and our alcohol tracers, to, to, to that zone. Uh, so I think, and, and given, you know, if you kind of use your your cubic law, the, the the fracture aperture should have been around the, you know, in the, in the certainly in the tens of microns. So we should have been able to uh, to put in to uh, to deliver our lactate, and also the bacteria should should have uh, made its way easily into that fracture zone. Well, unfortunately, because we're you know we're sampling that 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 bulk uh, that those bulk intervals, you know it's hard to to, to actually con to conclusively show that. But you know based on what we saw with the tracers and what we know about the fracture, I, I think uh, I think it's a reasonable expectation that our uh, bio amendments made it there. Great, thank you. And while concentrations of PCE decreased a couple of orders of magnitude, the levels were well above the appropriate cleanup levels. Are there any plans to further monitor the site to see how long cleanup will actually take 
Right. So we are going to be monitoring, you know, for 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 another several months just to see, you know, what what happens to all those con- uh, to concentrations. But I I think certainly my my expectation is that for PCE and DCE and maybe some other daughter products, concentrations will remain well above well above cleanup levels. And I think even you know what's uh, how even the the effects of matrix back diffusion at least in the short term like, you know a couple of years are going to maintain those those levels high uh, pretty high but i think yeah, i think on on the positive side of that you know i do expect to see uh, some and have seen certainly in the short term some very large decreases in in pce concentrations and ultimately this will result in a in a substantial decrease in mass in mass discharge in basically what is you know which which is what is feeding this very large plume and and over time that decrease in mass discharge should result in a in a, in a, in a shrinkage of that of that plume. Charles, in the case of bioaugmentation, uh, was biomass plugging a problem? And if it did occur, would that impact the mass discharge? It might actually increase it possibly. Sure. Uh, so we we did have some. We had to go out and uh, you know kind of passively uh, redevelop the injection well once or twice during the demonstration. Although it wasn't exactly clear to us that it was actually biofouling that was causing the issue. There may have been some some mineral precipitate issues. Uh, so, so certainly that's something we had to we had to stay on top of a little bit for this site, and again, primarily because it was such low low transmissivity, and we didn't want it to drop uh, drop too much. But you know, the the second the second part of that question is also pretty in, pretty interesting. You know, could you know uh, could could the biofiling impact mass discharge? And I, I I would I would expect if you know if we were were uh, somehow falling, fouling or reducing the, the transmissivity of some of these zones that had high PCE levels in there, that that could actually work to effectively reduce the mass discharge. And, and you know, the, the extent to which the, the flow field was, was modified uh, due to, uh, due to bioaugmentation, that, that's one of the things we're going to try to look at and assess when we do that, that final partitioning tracer test just to see how, how the flow field changed. Great. Um, can you comment on whether there's a possibility that DNAPL was migrating during the tracer testing? And that's that's another you know that's another good question. You know uh, we you know we looked for the for the potential for any uh, DNAPL migration when we were doing a lot of our um, a lot of our uh, initial uh, pump tests and things like that just to see if there were any you know droplets or things that we were, we were pulling out from. Uh, from from the wells, we we never we never saw anything. Although that's probably not, you know, I mean we could have easily missed it if there were some trace levels. But I think I think more convincing than that, the, you know, the levels of of Dean Apple uh, fracture saturation, if if you will, were were uh, were below one percent. And when you have such low levels, you you would not expect there to be any uh, any significant uh, mobility or migration of, of your of your Dean Apple. You know that being said, we you know, we can't absolutely rule it out, but it's very unlikely that there there was any any substantial movement of of, of Dean Apple that that occurred. Great. Uh, did you collect or did you perform any bench scale uh, studies or collect field data? to demonstrate the benefits of bioaugmentation versus just injecting carbon sources and nutrients to generate and build up a DHC population? Right, we yeah, we did uh, we did do a uh, an, an initial bench scale uh, bench scale study, uh, and we did compare um, the you know uh, just biostimulation versus bioaugmentation, and we uh, we we basically did not see. Any measurable dechlorination with biostimulation, but but we did with with bio augmentation, at least at least for, within the time frame of the of the experiment, which was uh, which was a, um, I believe it was a two two months or so. Great. We have a question from EPA um, saying that the Air Force estimated that over 1,000 gallons of solvent were released at that portion of Edwards Air Force Base. So your estimate of 1.5 kilograms of Dean Apple may suggest that the product may have moved past your study area. Do you have any insight as to where it has migrated? Sure. Well, we you know we looked at a very small uh, portion of, of even of even that that source area. I mean, we, we were only looking within about a uh, about a 20 foot interval. You know, with it, with you know with about a 
14 foot radius to that to that monitoring well. If you went down another 100 feet, which there were some existing monitoring wells in the area, you still had some very high, you know, percent solubility PCE concentration. So that that uh, 1.5 kilogram number that I gave was was only in, a, in that very uh, very restricted volume of where we did, uh, where we had the tracer test in that in that monitoring well. I, I would I would expect if we did a a much larger scale tracer test, which would might be a bit problematic regarding how how hard it is to uh, to to find wells that are really hydraulically uh, uh, hydraulically connected. And I know Lee's going to be talking to, about some of that in, in the following seminar. But I would think that we would come up then with a much with a much larger number. In fact, if I you know did some back of the envelope numbers and just kind of took that, uh, you know, assume we had that type of DNAPL concentration and just kind of put a kind of bigger, applied a bigger volume to it, we might come up with something that makes more sense with, with, uh, with respect to the initial release. Great, thank you. Um, how far down, down gradient do you believe the effective remediation zone extended? Yeah, that's that's another that's another good question. You know, we had, we had hoped that we would see a lot of our remedial amendments kind of make their way to the extraction wells, but you know, unfortunately, due to the, to the complexities of, of fracture flow, we, we really did, we really didn't see that. You know, we we did see the the amendments make it to to the next monitoring well, which was which was about 30, 30 feet. Um, but then, you know, then we just didn't have wells that that were really along the fracture fracture flow path. So, I, I don't think uh, I don't think I have I have a good answer for that question. But certainly, that type of question is, is certainly important when you're when you're trying to treat a, a large area of 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 of, uh, of impacted fracture bedrock. And certainly, um, is something that you know when if if you're contemplating a, a full scale treatment, you know, would probably need to have a better handle on. Thank you, Charles. We're not going to be able to get to all of the questions that were submitted, but there is a final Q&A session at the end of the webinar. But before we transition to our second speaker, uh, perhaps a bigger picture question for you on what you think the results of this study mean for the potential of actually remediating this portion of Edwards Air Force Base or similar sites with um, you know, uh, fractured bedrock. Can you comment on that? Sure. I think you know. I think the I think the good news is that you know where where we can get our our uh, remedial amendments. You know, we seem to be able to to be able to treat these Dean Apple sources, and uh, you know, much as kind of I think what we've learned in unconsolidated materials. You know, when we can get the bacteria and the electron donor there, I think we get uh, sufficient. Uh, uh, Biological kinetics and rates that you know it can it can really help help things along. You know I think uh, you know certainly one of the challenges at Edwards Air Force Base was you know was or is the the complex fracture flow paths is is the low transmissivity. So I think those are those are issues that would need to be somehow overcome at this site to maybe have a a little rosier picture of being able to treat the source area. Uh, but I think, you know, I think for I think for fractured bedrock sites where you can you can get get the amendments there, uh, I, I think I think this does give us um, give us some some optimism. Wonderful. Thank you, Charles. You've done a great job with your presentation and an excellent job with the Q and A session. And with that we would like to transition to our second speaker, Dr. Lee Slater. Lee is a professor of near surface geophysics at Rutgers in North New Jersey. His current areas of research focus on the development of borehole based geophysical technologies for improving the understanding of rock properties, control flow and mass transport, and as well as geophysical monitoring technologies for tracking amendment delivery and long term biogeochemical alterations caused by contaminant degradation. Lee earned a bachelor's degree in environmental science from the University of East Anglia in the UK, and he also holds both master's and doctoral degrees in environmental science from Lancaster University also in the UK, as you will find out from his lovely accent. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to you, Lee. Okay, thank you, Ruda. Um, I'd like to start as well by acknowledging the team members. This is very much a uh, team project. Um, Fred Day Lewis and John Lane from the USGS um, branch of geophysics, uh, Alan Shapiro from the USGS in Reston, 
uh, Judy Robinson um, and Demetrius Dalagianis from Rutgers University and uh, Tim Johnson from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. So for the agenda today, I'm going to talk uh, through some of the characterization and amendment injection challenges in fractured rock and the need for uh, geophysical technologies. I'm going to focus on electrical resistivity tomography, ERT, um, and as, as the technology we tested on the CSTC project. And I'm going to provide an overview and an application um, demonstration of this uh, technology at the Naval Air Warfare Center uh, in New Jersey. Um, we'll look at some characterization and monitoring results and some validation against supporting data. Um, and I'll finish by um, talking about the DOD relevance and benefits of this technology. And a key message here is that geophysical imaging technologies can be used to characterize heterogeneity, monitor amendment injection strategies, and evaluate the zone of influence of um, amendment injections. So most people on this call will recognize the challenges of um, characterization um, and monitoring of the fate amendment um, of the fate uh, of, of amendments injected into fractured rock systems, and uh, these these challenges occur because of the large permeability variation in fractured rock systems, um, the expense, the relative expense of um, drawing and uh, performing direct invasive sampling in uh, fractured rock systems, and. Uh, uh, Charles took us through um, some of the issues here with uh, in amendment injection challenges when he talked about his own uh, experiment. And uh, it's quite common that the fate of amendments injected into the subsurface to uh, remediate contaminants is often relatively poorly understood. And again, this problem tends to be accentuated in fractured rock. And so some of the questions that end up uh, needing to be answered uh, are things like, what is the zone of influence of an amendment injection? Or perhaps more specifically, when we're talking about fractured rock systems uh, and we're dealing with um, uh, fracture zones that are um, heavily contaminated and also uh, transport of uh, mass into um, the adjoining uh, low porosity um, rock mass close to fracture zones. Um, what is the surface area of these fracture zones that are impacted um, by amendment strategies? So the method that we've demonstrated in this ESTCP project is electrical resistivity tomography. And uh, you can think about this as the site remediation equivalent of medical tomography. So in medical tomography, before we had an NMR and CAT scans, um, we had um, electrical resistance tomography where electrodes were placed on your body. Here's a picture here of a, um, uh, somebody's leg. And the electrodes uh, have been placed around the body and uh, around the leg and voltages, uh, currents are being injected and voltages are being measured. And uh, from these measurements, from a large number of such measurements, the distribution of the resistivity of, the, in this case, the leg can be uh, determined. And uh, it provides some information on the distribution of bone versus muscle, et cetera. Um, of course, this technology in, in the medical field has been surpassed by CAT scans and NMRs and those kind of things. But really, for environmental remediation um, uh, applications, ERT is really the site remediation equivalent of medical tomography, and we still use this method. And uh, um, here you can see in this picture the, um, an, uh, an array of electrodes going into the ground. So these you can just make out the electrodes on this array here. So these replace the electrodes you see on that leg. Uh, and these electrodes are going into the ground, um, into a borehole. And on this right-hand image here, we can see one, two, just three boreholes as an example on these little black, the smaller black squares there again represent the electrodes. And then from these electrodes then, again, we can inject currents, measure voltages, and generate um, a, a 3D uh, high resolution um, the distribution of electrical resistivity or electrical conductivity of um, the rock mass. So the method relies on electrical conductivity contrast, and we want to exploit the natural electrical, electrical conductivity contrast that exists in fractured rock. And these exist because typically the Water bearing um, regions or fracture zones are typically more electrically conductive. Of course, geology also controls electrical conductivity contrast. We can have uh, contrast between clay rich soils that are relatively electrically conductive versus um, sandier soils, for example, or between uh, highly fractured and, and massive rocks. So there's many, there's many uh, geological variations that can cause um, electrical conductivity contrasts. The fracture zones in particular tend to be um, highly electrically conductive relative to the rock mass. Um, so the demonstration site was the Naval Air Warfare Center uh, in New Jersey, and um, here um, contaminant transport is primarily through fractured 
uh, zones, and this uh, site has been relatively well studied um, through previous ESDCP and CERDIC funded projects and ongoing ones. Um, and uh, this is a site of a mudstone, a, a sequence of alternating massive and laminated mudstones, and uh, the, um, uh, the fracture zones control the, the transport. Um, of um, primary TCE from uh, a, a jet engine testing facility at the site. And so you can see on this uh, uh, cross-section here the TCE concentrations uh, that have been recorded from direct sampling of different zones of the rock mass. And the, uh, the, the, it's pretty well understood at this site that the, the fracture zones, the key fracture zones, the highly hydraulically collected fracture zones are transporting the uh, contaminant mass, which is then is typically being locked up in the um, immobile porosity of the rock mass uh, adjoining these fractures um, resulting in a long-term contaminant or same problem. Uh, on the right here, you can see um, um, we drilled, uh, to do this demonstration, we drilled um, a, a network of um, seven boreholes, and uh, unfortunately one was missing on this slide, but the center borehole is 83 BR, and uh, then we had a ring of electrodes, uh, a ring of, of borehole arrays, um, around that center, center um, array, and uh, there were six of them, um, and roughly on a radius of uh, 15 feet apart. So the, the, the electrodes are in boreholes that are um, roughly 15 feet apart, spokes of the wheel folk, um, centered on this um, 83BR. And uh, uh, they, they, they were drilled down. We, the, the zone that we were primarily um, imaging um, was from about 50 to 120 foot below um, land surface, and this put us into the most heavily contaminated zone, into a region that was that we knew would capture a couple of um, very important fracture zones at this site from previous um, studies that have been done at the site, um, and uh, and that was the uh, focus of our study in cross section. So. Uh, an important part of this uh, demonstration project really involved technology development. This technique has been been around for a number of years, um, but there were some real challenges in, in effectively applying this in fractured rock um, uh, settings. And uh, one of the problems we have to overcome is that the um, boreholes, when you drill a borehole into the ground, as many of you will know, that's going to generate, if you don't isolate it, that's going to generate a very hydraulically conductive um, uh, uh, connection between potentially um, uh, other, other um, fracture zones, for example, so that you end up with this vertically um, highly hydraulically conductive um, unit caused by the borehole, the presence of the borehole. In the same way, the, the, the borehole also um, causes problems with electrical measurements because it acts as a highly electrically conductive channel and channelizes the current flow and prevents uh, the current uh, and hence the, the, um, the information content coming from the rock mass between the boreholes. So we had to um, address some of these issues. So there was a lot of development that went in here and we, we ended up building these um, arrays that you can see in this left-hand photograph here, which consisted of a number of um, uh, piece important components. Obviously, firstly, we had the electrodes, which were critical to injecting the electrical currents and measuring the voltages, so this, these guys here. Um, but then we also had to have packers, so we custom built our own packer systems, and that's what you see here on these arrays, to isolate intervals of the borehole and to prevent this highly electrically conducted vertical um, channel. Uh, we also need to do validation of the method because we are measuring proxies here with geophysics. We're measuring electrical conductivity and we're treating this as a proxy um, either of geological structure or when we're dealing with amendment injections and tracking amendments, we're relying on um, the conductivity contrast between the amendment, the electrical conductivity contrast between the amendment and the native um, groundwater. And so to validate that, we needed to also capture some um, direct sampling of, um, uh, of uh, um, water from the, during the amendment injections that we could then run specific conductance tests on. So you see a number of lines here. So there's, hose, there's lines for the packers, obviously. There's lines for the electrodes, um, wires coming up to the surface from the electrodes. And then there's also lines um, for uh, monitor uh, for, for for capturing um, a water sample, and this was all custom built as part of this um, uh, design and custom built as part of this uh, project. Um, we rely heavily also on um, not using the geophysics blindly. Um, in order to uh, constrain the interpretation of these geophysical imaging, these medical imaging methods, um, equivalent methods, we, we want to we be able to use whatever, whatever, whatever other information we have available because it, this geophysical technique is very much an, uh, a non-unique problem. We have to um, 
constrain in some way the, um, the, what we call the inversion, which is what gives us these 3D images. Um, and to, and we, can, we can help constrain the inversion to the most uh, geologically, geologically reasonable solution um, if we can provide information where we have it. In our case, when you drill a borehole, there is some very important information that can come from that borehole. Um, Charles already made a comment to the importance and the value of geophysical logging technologies. These are sensors that, again, many people may have used where you um, log some physical or chemical property local to the borehole. So this is very different from the TRT technique. We just get some information now very much local to the borehole, maybe a 1D vertical profile that senses a very small distance from the borehole. But this can be very useful for us because we can identify um, where the primary fracture zones are, at least in the borehole, and obviously the tomographic the geophysical images should show some correspondence with that. Um, but we can also use information on the um, electrical conductivity of the borehole by just measuring the conductivity profile of specific conductance log. This can really help us deal with the challenges of, um, of, of incorporating the problematic boreholes into the inversion procedure to generate these images that we have high confidence faithfully do, re do reflect the 3D structure of the site. And so we, we run many logs at this site. I'm just showing one example. We have a natural gamma log that happens to be very good at picking out the fracture zones at the Naval Air Warfare Center. And these logs were run by Pierre Lacoon for the USGS. Um, and we, as I said, we're here in this yellow box, we feed this model in. We feed such information as constraints on our imaging. We also uh, did uh, extensive um, hydraulic testing. And this work was done um, by Claire Tideman of the USGS. And this slide lacks an important acknowledgment there to Claire. Um, and uh, she did extensive cross-hole hydraulic testing as part of this project on that, uh, on that array. And you can see much better here in this image on the right the, just the, the, the seven arrays and how they're arranged, the seven boreholes, sorry, and how they're arranged. And the green box highlights um, the the most hydraulically connected zone that was found at the site. And this was really the site that we were targeting for amendment injections. And this was the, the, this was the zone, the fracture zone that we wanted to highlight the application of this um, technology upon. And so we'll be, we'll be seeing um, images of, uh, that focus on this, um, uh, of this particular highly um, hydraulically conductive um, and highly connected fracture zone. So there's two pieces of information we can get from this kind of technology, and it really comes down to how much time and energy you have. Um, the the left-hand side of this um, of these two figures shows really the state of the art, the kind of the the the, the, the eye candy um, geophysical information that we can get, which is a fully um, 3D realization of the. Um, in this case, as an example, uh, this is just one snapshot that I'll look at. I'll take you through shortly of the distribution of the amendment at some point in time after it's been injected, and so we can get these really, really impressive-looking 3D images that capture where the amendment injection is going. Um, but we can also do something much simpler that can be very valuable um, and can uh, and is a lot quicker to do, um, and that is we can just turn these boreholes arrays. So if you look at these borehole arrays, you can recognize that these arrays are a, a, a line of electrodes, and we can run very simple vertical profiles down here um, and very quickly record just voltages during current injection. And you can think of this as then becoming like a long um, line of specific conductance probes, except that they see beyond just the borehole they do sense the, um, the formation close to the borehole and the pore fluids in the formation. And so we can generate these 1D profiles, almost like a, a sequence of specific conductance measurements simultaneously. And this can be done extremely rapidly. And so we use both of these um, approaches to uh, perform the monitoring of the amendment injection we did um, at, these, at these sites at this site. So coming to some of the results then, um, firstly, we image um, and characterize the um, geology and structure of the, of the site. So here we're looking at an electrical image of this, um, of, of this a 3D, this is a slice through this 3D volume of rock mass that we've imaged with this electrical resistivity tomography. And it's hard to appreciate the information content here, but you're imaging about 1,000 cubic meters of fractured rock mass at about a meter or so resolution. And you can immediately identify the primary structures at the site. We see this alternating um, uh, red and blue, um, high and relatively high and relatively low conductivity, electrical conductivity. Um, and uh, this, is, this, this follows the strike of the um, 
uh, of the um, uh, um, and, and the and the dip, sorry, of these um, of this alternating sequence of uh, mass, massive and laminated mudstones, with the um, massive mudstones being more electrically resistive than the laminated. Um, and so you see straight away that the, the image reflects the geological structure very very nicely. Um, and in, here's another view of that same image in a slightly different direction, um, looking, at, looking along a different direction here. And, and here superimposed on it is some of our validation data. And you can see these uh, large black um, uh, rectangles here representing the primary fracture intersections in the boreholes. And here's some acoustic teleview logs here for two of these boreholes showing those fracture zones. Um, and, and, and this is this highly electrically conductive continuous feature here. You'll note that this, this feature here of all the electrically conductive features in this in this uh, image, is the most continuous and most connected. And this is that exact interval that Claire Tiedemann's um, work um, with the hydraulic testing identified as the most conductive zone. And so this was the, this this interval is the zone that, and this is also a heavily contaminated zone. And this is a uh, the interval that we focused our amendment injection um, demonstration upon. So now turning to the, the, the real kind of the, the most critical use of this technology is really to, um, to uh, monitor what happens when we inject an amendment into the subsurface. And anyone like Charles that's done these amendment injections knows that you're always scratching your head um, wondering, where is this? Uh, is it going where I want it to? How, what's the zone of influence? How can I prove to my, my whoever funded my project or my client that I've really actually managed to uh, do what I said I was going to do? Is going to have some zone of influence, or um, I'm going to impact so much volume of the subsurface? And this is where this technology really can come in. Uh, and secondly, we once we've set this up, this array, this system is set up so that you can do injections um, uh, and simultaneously do monitoring. So we can repeatedly do these measurement, these monitoring um, um, measurements so, and do the amendment injection at the same time. And more importantly, we can also do um, test tracer injection. So before we, do our, uh, before we finally want to do our amendment injection and put our money where our mouth is, perhaps we want to do some relatively saline tracer injections and test the effectiveness of different push, pull, pump, inject strategies because obviously how effective your amendment injection strategy is going to be is largely going to be is partly going to be determined by um, how you deliver the, the, the amendment. And so we, we explored this. And so I'm just going to take you through a few different strategies um, uh, and demonstrate how the imaging and the ERT can allow us to determine the effectiveness of these different strategies. So the first one didn't work. And the first um, strategy was we um, injected in the center borehole in 83 BR and we extracted from 87 BR. Um, as you can see in the left-hand image there. And we had a certain volume and a certain um, conductivity contrast um, that we, we knew we would be able to see. Um, but we tested this, and, um, and, we, and we imaged the effectiveness of this strategy. And you can see on the right-hand side here the evolution of the tracer. These are, ch these are changes in electrical conductivity over time being imaged throughout the rock mass. So this also is this 3D information, but you're just looking at isocontours of a certain percentage change in conductivity. And this is an isocontour of an 8% or more increase in conductivity, electrical conductivity, due to the injection of this tracer. And what we see in these images here on, on the right is we don't really get much tracer beyond the borehole, um, the, the injection borehole. This would have been a pretty poor amendment injection strategy. So then we change it, and so we do a different injection strategy, and so we played around. And Alan Shapiro, who really knows this site extremely well, kind of came up with some different approaches here, and and uh, and so we, we we changed things. So we did a uh, injection now on this 87 BR uh, with extraction from 85 BR based on our hydraulic testing results and our expectation that there's strong hydraulic connectivity here. And, uh, and now what you can see in these right-hand images, and I'm showing cross-sections and plan view on the top now, is that this is a very effective amendment delivery injection strategy. This really floods that fracture plane when we did it this way with this, with this setup. And we clearly see the evolution of the tracer over time uh, from the injection well, um, flooding this, um, the surface area of this fracture plane and really reaching, um, at least within the, the volume of investigation of this um, study, um, This um, tracer um, into the uh, rock mass and into the fracture zone where we need it to be, and so based on that, we then use that kind of that approach to to actually deliver the amendments. So the amendment is tracer injections. Um, 
was um, a slight adjustment. We still injected into 87BR, but we actually didn't extract from 85BR, the philosophy being that we wanted to um, flood the fracture zone, but not pull the amendment out. We wanted to leave it there to sit there. And so you can see the amendment behaves a little bit differently. And it's really interesting to see how the amendment evolves. We can actually see in this um, right-hand image here, you can really see how the tracer is delivered under this injection scenario and actually um, uh, is pushed into this frac actually does a kind of a, like almost like a 90 degree turn here um, between time time four and time five here and monitoring time four and time five it does this almost 90 degree turn here and you see this really strong evidence of this channelized flow within this fracture zone so when we did this amendment injection we actually didn't flood as much the fracture zone as we did when we did that tracer injection and we actually had some channelized flow occurring some really strong evidence of channelized flow occurring and um, we actually monitored this amendment injection for long after months after we finished um, the injection, whereas those tracer tests I showed you were fairly short-term, monitored just over a day or two. And we monitored the long-term over up to about six months, the, um, uh, um, the, 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 the continued um, presence of this amendment in this, um, in this fracture zone. So as I said, it's important to validate geophysical data. So um, we can validate the geophysics a number of ways. I've already talked a few, about a few ways of validating the characterization images, the geological images, if you like. But um, obviously, as I said, the easiest way to validate the, um, the, uh, the, monitoring, in, um, the uh, uh, monitoring data is to actually pull specific uh, water samples for specific conductance measurements. So again, these arrays were designed to allow us to pull water from specific zones, and the water samples were analyzed for for, um, over time for specific conductance and sodium bromide as well in the case of the traces that we were using and to validate that what we are really seeing with the geophysical technology um, is what we think it is which is the migration of these traces and that was extremely effective um, at this site and if anybody um, is going to use geophysical technologies it's absolutely critical to make sure that whoever's doing the work incorporates some validation measurements um, uh, to, to provide that support and that confidence in the, in the interpretation of these geophysical data sets. So the final, to kind of wrap up some of the benefits here, I mean, one thing we can consider is cost assessment. Of course, the benefit of geophysics is that it's spatially um, extensive data and, um, uh, and uh, continuous data that you cannot very easily get from direct sampling. And so we just did a little test study here and just synthetic for our final report and said, what is the benefit here in terms of cost? Well, if we take a, we took a synthetic fracture zone, say so we took a synthetic fracture zone and, and said, look, let's pretend we injected an amendment and it, and it impacted this um, on this left-hand side here. Um, it, it impacted this amount of surface area of a fracture of a fracture zone, and uh, and then we explored how um, how effectively we image that fracture zone with ERT using our seven boreholes that we used in the ESPCP technology and study, and this is what we get. So we do a pretty good job. We've got some problems down here because this part of the um, of the uh, fracture zone that's actually affected by the amendment is outside of what we call our um, zone of high resolution because it's beyond our, our electrodes arrays here. So, so we miss this bit, but we do a very good job of, of getting everything else, I think you can see. And then we played around with, okay, if we just did direct sampling, and we just drilled lots and lots of holes. How many holes would we need to actually get a reliable estimate of this um, equivalent fracture surface area impacted? So just drill a hole and measure, okay, at that particular hole, is that, a, um, uh, is, is that um, an impacted zone or not? And uh, we found that by doing that, that we would need over 70 wells to reliably perform better um, than the information that we acquired from just seven wells using this uh, ERT technology. And so the case to be made here is that we can reduce costs dramatically if we effectively use these kind of technologies um, uh, in terms of drilling costs and sampling. So the takeaway messages here are, I hope I've kind of demonstrated here that this technology provides spatially continuous information on, on the physical properties and the distribution of um, amendments um, beyond boreholes. So the, uh, the point here is we're looking beyond boreholes and looking between boreholes. Um, and these tracer tests kind of set us, once we have this infrastructure installed, it really provides opportunities to test, evaluate, and perhaps optimize an amendment strategy. Um, but I want to uh, 
kind of uh, emphasized that geophysics cannot visualize contaminant concentration changes directly. The, you know, the Achilles heel of geophysics is always that we're looking at proxies of what we really want to look at. I showed you images of changes in electrical conductivity, which we've interpreted in terms of changes in specific conductance, which are then assumed to be due to changes in the um, concentration of the amendment. You need validation. You need to use the boreholes to validate and make sure that interpretation is correct because it's always a proxy measurement. Um, but I think there's a strong case to be made to assess, use this technology, technology to assess the effectiveness of, of delivery of injections. And it doesn't just have to be in fractured rock systems. We can use this technology in most geological systems um, for multiple remediation strategies, as long as there's an electrical conductivity contrast, which there very, very often is. Uh, and then in many cases, the, the amendment that you might be using can be spiked with uh, something that will enhance the conductivity contrast without adversely affecting the performance of the amendment. In terms of recommendations, there are some things that we, we need. We need boreholes. And um, to get any information at all, you need at least two boreholes. Uh, and in that case, it's a very limited, what we call two-dimensional interpretation, which has some serious constraints. And the state of the art today really is three-dimensional tomography. And, uh, and that means you need at least three boreholes to do three dimensions, and preferably more. In this case, we had seven. Um, in terms of between the borehole distances, we typically look to have a vertical length of open hole in which you can place these electrodes that should be at least um, one and a half times the um, spacing between the boreholes. And finally, this is still a technology that is available off the shelf, but I strongly um, argue that you need a geophysical exploit involved um, in terms of doing it with the kind of level of um, technology is being demonstrated here. Um, this is uh, not a trivial thing to, uh, um, to undertake without the um, input of a, of, an, of a geophysicist that's an expert in these electrical methods. But those, these techniques are increasingly being um, uh, transferred, and there are now contractors that, do, that offer these services. Um, in terms of the benefits, I mean, I think I've already demonstrated the time and cost reduction, the expanded spatiotemporal information, um, cost savings that can come, for example, from early abandonment of an amendment injection that is simply shown to not be working from these measurements. Um, you know, I think I've pointed to the fact that the, um, the technique um, is minimally invasive. And, and, and one thing to think about there is that um, you know, the less holes you drill on the subsurface to verify and validate, um, the better, um, obviously, particularly when you're concerned about cross-contamination um, between transmissive zones and human exposure. I mean, this, this technique potentially reduces the number of boreholes you need to drill at a site to understand what's going on. Um, and again, we, we want to emphasize the, the multi-use, multi-information approach that we kind of took here. And we, basically, what we've tried to do is turn sampling wells into sampling slash geophysics wells and, um, and to try and demonstrate that by doing that, we increase the information content we estimated in our final report by about a factor of 10 for a relatively small um, percentage of the capital costs. And uh, that's where I finish. So thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you so much, Lee. We have a number of questions for you. Um, okay. How does the resolution of the electrical imaging method change with distance from the borehole? Right. So um, this technique uh, is definitely um, highly dependent upon enough electrodes um, to get uh, sufficient resolution. And, and as we move away from the boreholes, um, the resolution um, redu is reduced because the current density um, is, is, is reduced. And so um, as it's dispersed uh, further and further into the Earth. And uh, so we need boreholes that typically are relatively close together um, to, to ensure high resolution. And uh, I gave that kind of um, rule of thumb of electrode of boreholes when they're doing this from boreholes, um, uh, boreholes that are separated um, by about um, 0.75 times the vertical open length that we're actually injecting electrical currents from these electrodes into. This technique can also be done from the surface of the Earth, using electrodes at the surface of the Earth if the site conditions are appropriate. Um, and in that case, we have the same issue that the resolution decreases uh, considerably from the surface deeper into the Earth. Okay. 
see. Uh, do the boreholes need to be uh, cased or uncased? We can do this um, in a number of different ways. Um, so in this case, um, in these fractured um, rock holes at the Naval Air Warfare Center, these were open holes. Um, and it was a research project, so we had a, a well deviation and, and uh, request then and a permit to leave them open um, with the packers, obviously, to do our um, research. Um, but there are other ways of doing this. Um, we can um, work in PVC cased holes that are um, uh, where the PVC, uh, where the, uh, PVC is screened. We can drop our raised down PVC um, case wells that are where the screen intervals are open. But we can also work on monitoring well installations and uh, um, installations of wells and place these electrodes that we need on the outside of monitoring wells. We've done that on a number of occasions where we've actually placed the electrodes on the outside of monitoring wells and installed them, been there with the drillers installing this so that then the well is a long term. ERT monitoring well as, as, and, and can also have multifunctionality um, as a groundwater sampling well, et cetera, as well. So there's a number of ways that this can be done. Hey, can this method be used to quantify or at least identify DNAPL in specific factor zones? No. This method cannot detect DNAPL. Okay. Um, would this monitoring technique work in unconsolidated sediments? Yes. Um, this technique uh, works very effectively in most geological systems. Um, it's a very versatile technique um, in, in that respect. I mean, pretty much all geological systems are characterized by electrical conductivity contrasts. And pretty much in any geological system, um, amendments, especially if they've been spiked, will be um, electrically conductive. I mean, we could think of a few exceptions, very briny aquifers, it might fall down. I mean, technique doesn't work so well for the petroleum industry because they're dealing with very brine rich aquifers, but for environmental um, um, near surface, environmental remediation studies, typically this technique is very effective in a diverse range of geological rock types, and there's many examples of that out there. Um, at what depth is the technology effective in, uh, in bedrock aquifers? At what depth? Yeah. Depends on how deep the holes are drilled. So um, it really, again, it, it all comes to we have to put these electrodes down boreholes to do um, high resolution imaging. You can do, you can do um, as I said, under, certain, under the right conditions, you can get quite a bit of information from surface geological surveys when you're looking at uh, ERT surveys when you're looking at near surface um, um, rock structures and amendments in the very near surface and the site conditions are appropriate. But if you're dealing, in our case, um, we were interested in um, uh, a, a depth range from 100, about um, 50 to 120 feet below ground surface. So we had to drill down to 120 feet, 120 feet, and install our electro uh, our arrays in that interval that we were interested in. So really, the question then becomes: How deep? Where? What is the zone that you're interested in? How deep is it? Um, if it's 300 feet down, you're going to have to drill boreholes down 300 feet that you can actually put these electrodes into. Um, so, but it. it there's no real technological constraint. Obviously, there's just a cost constraint. Great. And, and one, last, one last question uh, specifically directed at you before we open up the discussion and uh, bring Charles back in. Uh, this is a question from the Army Corps of Engineers, and they've heard from some geophysics uh, contractors that they can obtain adequate resolution for tracking aquifer amendment delivery and or fracturing using only two perpendicular rows of surface electrodes. Can you please comment on the use of only surface electrodes versus downhole electrodes for tracking? Sorry, I, I, I lost the, uh, using, you said using only 2% or what did you say? I missed that. Two using only? Perpendicular, two perpendicular rows. Of two perpendicular electrodes. rows of electrodes. I say to anybody who says that um, any of these kind of scenarios prove it. All of these things can be proven. Um, if any geophysical contractor tells you that they can do this and see this, tell them to prove it to you. Tell them to run a synthetic scenario. Um, set up some scenario that simulates your site, simulates the geology, assigns some electrical conductivities to those that geology, geology, thinks about your amendment injection or whatever you're doing, assign some electrical conductivity contrast to that and prove to you that they can really get anything useful out of it. Um, and I, I encourage anybody that is in that situation to strongly challenge anybody that comes to you to say they can do this to prove it to you. <laughs> 
it can be done synthetically. It's just like running a groundwater model. You can you can demonstrate um, that this technology has the potential to do what you want it to do using a, a, a day's work of, of a careful controlled synthetic scenarios based on your site site conditions. And if they can't do that, I would say be very very wary. Wonderful advice. Thank you so much, Ali. And then a question uh, for both you and Charles. Can you uh, both speak to the cost uh, associated with applying the field techniques that you discussed today? And, and for you, Lee, not just the cost, but uh, are you moving towards um, maybe commercializing the technology that you've developed? And how can people access and use these techniques? Charles, do you want to take the first stab? Or was that was that for me? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess with respect to the field techniques, you know, uh, employing those those partitioning tracer tests, I think costs are going are going to be similar to to any type of of tracer test you want to perform in fractured bedrock. Uh, when doing the partitioning tracer test, you probably want to want to sample for a little bit longer to catch some more of the tail, and then you also have the analysis of, of the alcohols, which you know which which can be done on you know GC FID. So you know it's 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 going to cost a little bit more than a um, than a than a, than a typical trace, tracer test, but not but not a whole lot more. You know in terms of you know how much of the site you want to investigate and and, and your depth intervals and things like that. You know that's obviously going to going to add. Add some cost there, but I always like to think of it as you know what's what's the cost of not doing it, of, of not knowing where your Dean Apple sources really are, and and uh, you know also spending you know maybe spending the resources to, to treat a zone that that really doesn't have your Dean Apple sources where you can be treating a much more a uh, much smaller more more focused area. So that's because uh, that, that's how I would answer that question. Great. Yeah. Can you talk about the costs associated with your technology and also the the ability of end users getting access to it? Right. So there are there are geophysical contractors that offer some some of these services now, um, and uh, the cost will scale obviously with the with the um, the number of if you like the number of boreholes or the number of electrodes, the the, the size of the site, the the, the zone that's being um, investigated, um, and that's a bit of a, a moving target, just like with any other you know, a technique that's being used for um, site site investigation where you're relying on sampling. Um, but um, the, I, I think the difference is that the, some of the some of the infrastructure that we had to build to do this correctly in fractured rock and do it highly effectively in fractured rock um, that has kind of been like a, I think a first time demonstration, um, and uh, that took some figuring out. And that's still uh, you know we built those arrays to allow us to do the validation, to allow us to do the hydraulic um, isolation of the boreholes to limit the borehole um, problems. Um, and, and that obviously adds um, a significant cost. Um, I think you could probably get these surveys done without those bells and whistles um, for um, probably a price that's, um, that, that brings some potentially some cost savings, um, assuming the geophysics is done is done right. Um, but I think that the infrastructure that we've we've constructed for this um, is really um, you know something that's not commercially yet available. Um, we haven't we we patented as part of it, but we haven't actually commercially built built the in, in, the instrumentation. Do you intend to, Lee? And if so, what is your timeline? Um, we don't have any. Um, I mean, being a university, we don't have a mandate really to go commercializing um, this kind of um, instrumentation. Um, and that's not to say that we wouldn't be interested in you know helping to see it. Um, see these kind of arrays being built. I mean, I think one of the problems with this technology is that um, there aren't any real, there's no real way to get the, the hardware that you really need to do this effectively uh, constructed um, um, with the geophysical expertise that might be needed to get the most out of these measurements and to prevent these problems that can arise um, when you just arbitrarily stick electrodes down boreholes. Um, so I think that you know we would we would have an interest in um, in, in collaborating potentially on on that, but we're not probably going to be turning it into a, a production outfit ourselves. Great. And before we wrap up, a question also for both of you: uh, What key challenges, in your opinion, remain 
as far as determining the fate of contaminants in fractured rock environments. Charles? You know, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I, I think, um, you know, I think dealing with the, uh, with the, with the heterogeneity and, uh, you, know, you know, whether it's deep apple source areas or, or the, you know, or the connected down gradient flow path, you know, even, even, you know, even in this tracer test, you know, you, you're only looking at, at deep apple that's, that's in contact with the, with the flow path of the tracers and what might be in some kind of lower flow zones, even within the track, fracture plane that you're not detecting. And, you know, so I think that that type of heterogeneity is, as a, is is remains a challenge, but I also really, I wanted to and someone just put a, a a comment on the chat here that I um and it's basically you know has to do with you know how effective is biological treatment you know you, you know do I agree that MCLs are probably not possible and and I and I and I would tend to agree with that I I think why while, while biological treatment in deep apple source areas can can actually do a very good job in reducing groundwater concentrations reducing uh, mass discharge you know when you have when you have deep apple present boy uh, <laughs> reaching MCLs or even coming close to MCLs you know probably a really big challenge unless you unless you have some other beneficial things going on in your uh, in your system that, that 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 can help you along so i just wanted to chime in on that question great thank you lee do you want to add uh, anything before we wrap up about key challenges remaining in determining the fate of contaminants in fractured rock i'll just briefly mention the, the what interests me is the whole issue of what 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 contaminant mass resides in this low, these, these low porosity units uh, um, adjacent to these fractures and the fact that it's so difficult it seems to have any technologies that can actually sense into the immobile porosity and um, geophysics can also play a very significant role there because whereas typical hydraulic um, uh, sampling method methodologies um, sample from the mobile pore space only, geophysical measurements like, like based on electrical currents, they will, they will actually propagate and invade the immobile pore space of the rock, and so we have the potential to extract very useful information from geophysics, and that's something that I'm personally very interested in looking at. Great. Well, thank you both uh, for a fantastic presentation. I'd like to remind our audience before we wrap up that the next webinar in the SIRTUP and ESCCP webinar series is on Thursday, September 17, and it will focus on water geophysical sensors for addressing uh, munitions response issues. This webinar will feature two speakers, Dr. Mark Prouty from Geometrics and Dr. Thomas Bell from LIDOC. Before we conclude, I'd like to remind you that the audio as well as a copy of today's presentation uh, will be available on the SIRTUP and ESCCP webinar page uh, if you'd like to refer to them in the future. And now we would uh, really appreciate it if you can take a moment from your busy day to complete the survey that will pop up on your screen uh, after the webinar concludes. And with that, um, we'll call this a wrap. Thank you.